you everyone for joining us today to discuss strategies for TBE and dual language science classrooms. Um, I'm Erica Flores. I'm a resource specialist at the Long Island Arborn. Uh, and before we get started, I just want to share a couple of things with you. Um, I invite you to visit our website, join our listserv, and follow us on Twitter. I also want to um, introduce our brand new YouTube channel where you can find recordings of past webinars and instructional snapshots. And at this time, I want to welcome everyone to please sign into the chat using your first and last name and district so we can confirm attendance and provide CTLE credit. So um, today we have Suzanne Pena with us. I know I see the familiar faces here, so you might uh, already know Suzanne, uh, but she's been an educator in K-12 setting for over 15 years. She started her career in the DOE um, as a dual language uh, and, and then moved on to being a dual language program coordinator in Harlem. She also held the role of district coordinator in Amityville for ESL and bilingual programs. Um, an adjunct professor at Brooklyn College. So she's been everywhere. Uh, now Suzanne joins us from Florida, where she uh, is manager of the Dual Language Steps Grant Program and is also enrolled in the Curriculum and Instruction Doctoral Program. So um, Suzanne will be with us for three more sessions for three more bilingual workshops, if you're interested. And without further ado, I wanna welcome Suzanne and turn the presentation over to you now. All right. Okay, let me do my screen share. Uh, all right, I think we're good. Um, buena dia. I'm super excited to see some familiar faces. Um, and it is so exciting to be back. Um, I, I love doing these uh, webinars and, and sharing some strategies and kind of having that camaraderie. Um, and, and for you guys to also share what you've been doing as well. Um, like Erica said, I, you know, uh, both her and I, we're, we're, we're also, you know, we're, we're, we're students as well, <laughs> so we're learning, <laughs> and so please don't mind the gray hairs that are coming out, you know, <laughs> from all the studying that we're doing as well. Um, welcome everyone, buenos dia. Uh, just a couple of things, um, I'm going to be, uh, like many of my other webinars, I'm going to be doing the webinar both in English and in Spanish. Uh, so, but if there's something that you miss, because I'm, uh, when I say it in Spanish or whatnot, please just let us know so that we can um, just go back to it or, or, or talk about it later on. Um, just a couple of uh, things here in terms of contact information about me. I don't know why my picture came out so big. Please ignore that. <laughs> For some reason, it was like huge. Um, anywho, but um, uh, my email is here, Suzanne Pena at SMP. Uh, edconsulting.com, my website, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and recently um, a YouTube channel. Just check us out. Um, if you have any questions or anything like that that you would like to ask me or even after uh, the webinar, um, if you think of something and, and whatnot, uh, please feel free to reach out. I, am, I try to be really, really uh, responsive um, in terms of time. So, and if I totally forget, I do apologize. I do have mommy, be, mommy brain, as I call it. Um, I, I, I am the proud mommy of a lovely one-year-old. So um, sometimes things, you know, I forget. Um, go ahead and send me another email and tell me, hey, Suzanne, you forgot about me. Um, and I will, uh, I will respond. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, make sure to leave your video on. If you can, I understand is Zoom and, you know, we're at home and, you know, like, thankfully you guys don't get to see the mess that I have going on here, which is awesome. You get to see lovely books in the back. Um, but if you can, because in that way it allows us uh, to participate, but if, if you can't, I totally get it. Um, if, uh, please mute your mic when not speaking. And with all uh, webinars or in-person uh, sessions, I think participation is key to the success of a webinar or a in-person session because we want to learn from each other. So me going on for whatever number of hours, it's not going to be as productive if you guys also share your and, and give us your input because that is very important. 
and we'll be using the chat box to ask and answer questions and also uh, the raise your hand feature on Zoom. So maybe Erica, we can go over that one really quickly on, um, it should be on your Zoom uh, toolbox and you could use the little icon as well. Um, and yeah, and that's pretty much it I think in terms of, uh, and I do apologize if there's any technical issues because you know how technology is. It could work when you want it to and then when you don't, you know, when it, uh, when it decides to work, then it'll work, right? Um, so the goals for today's webinar, we're going to be exploring uh, learning tools and strategies. Um, I thought that not only talk about strategies, but also different tools that are out there that we can use in a transitional bilingual classroom as well as a dual language science classroom. And I think that even, um, and you'll be able to see that these are going to be tools and strategies that are just good teaching. Good teaching is good teaching. So you might be even able to share them with your colleagues that are not in a TBE or DL classroom um, because they're just good teaching strategies or tools. Um, we're gonna be building or adding onto our pedagogical toolbox and we're gonna learn from each other because that's in the importance about this. Um, learning from one another, seeing what we have tried, if we've tried any of these, if not, you know, what are you thinking when you, um, you know, after you learn about any of these strategies, hey, how am I going to implement that? Whatever your ideas are might help a colleague of yours that is attending this webinar. So go ahead and share. Um, again, I always bring it back to the guiding principles because I think that when we talk about any program within the umbrella of bilingual education, it's important that we are guided by principles. And these principles, I think, are um, uh, pertinent to both TBE or DL classroom. So if you haven't gotten your copy yet, you can download your free copy. Um, I have actually uh, hyperlinked the, the link where you can get your free copy of this manual um, electronically. If you wanna purchase like the hard copy, you can, um, but that has a fee, but the, uh, the free version is electronic, so it's hyperlinked to this picture. Um, and I, again, I always take it back to the three pillars. Because if we focus on these three pillars of education, like I always say, we're going to be fine, right? If we focus our lesson planning on these three pillars, we should be fine. Um, and so I think that when we think about anything that has to do with dual language or TBE classrooms, we should think about bilingualism and biliteracy. Is it meeting that goal? Is it meeting the goal of high academic achievement? Is it meeting the goal of social cultural competence? If it's not falling into any of those three, then that's when we got to stop, pause, and think, hmm, maybe I should just hold off on this. Um, and, or how can I change it up so that it falls onto, un, under one of these three pillars, if not all. And then, as I always say, we're going to focus, we're going to hone in today, and it's going to be on strategies and tools specifically for science in the TBE or du dual language classroom. And how do we teach that? And we're gonna be guiding it through several uh, key strategies, I would say, or key points that we should have in a science classroom or a science lesson, and then we'll work from those, okay? So, um, as I mentioned before, if you have any questions or I'm going too fast, go ahead and uh, put it on the chat. Um, Eric is going to be monitoring the chat for, for us, so she will be taking care of that and letting me know when to pause. So go ahead and if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and pause um, and put it on the chat. Um, so when teaching science in a TBE or dual language classroom, we have to keep in mind a couple of things, right? And these are the six points that I think are crucial when we talk about science, especially in a TBE or dual language classroom or anything that has to let's put it on, under the bilingual education umbrella, right? First off, activate background knowledge, right? We have to think about this very carefully, okay? It is very important. We're gonna go, um, I'm gonna go over each of these six points very uh, detailed later as I go through the presentation. I'm just gonna go through the six points right now and then we'll talk more about them. 
um, teach language through content. A lot of times what happens is with science and, and content areas, we tend to forget about teaching language. So today we're gonna focus a little bit about teaching language through content. We also have to make sure, right, taking it back to the social cultural competency component and goal of dual language or TBE education, right, uh, bilingual education, is making connections between what the students are learning and their real life experiences. If you were, um, if you were part of the PLC that we had on Monday, um, we were talking about exactly that, which was, you know, social cultural competency and really making those connections. And I think that even as adults, when we think about real life experiences and when we're able to make connections with what the, the material that we're learning and, you know, our own experiences, it kind of sticks to our brains a little bit better, right? Same thing works for students. Um, the other point is exploration, experimentation, and hands-on. Um, I think, especially for science, it is very, very important that we do this. When we're planning our lessons, when we're thinking about what we're going to put in there, hands-on, experimentation, demonstrations, exploration, these are things that are very, very important. If we don't have them, hey, we got to go back to that lesson plan and add something, okay? Develop and encourage critical thinking skills. We're going to talk a little bit about this because when it comes to science, there's a way that we tend to talk or present science, and we often don't encourage critical thinking, okay? We don't, we don't foster these skills for our students, and we have to make sure that we do so. And then the use of technology for demonstrations and for other things. Um, as we know right now, we're using a lot of technology, right? We're, we're doing remote slash virtual slash um, distance learning, right? Um, and we don't know what the future holds. Um, so because of this, it's even more paramount that we continue to do this, but we do it mindfully, not just put technology just for the sake of putting something cutesy in there, but that it has a purpose, right? Um, and it serves a purpose to demonstrate to students a specific um, strategy, a specific concept that has to do with science or any other content area. Okay, so, oh, what happened? Okay, and it went too far. See, this is what happened, technology, right? So let's go and dive a little bit deep into activating prior knowledge or background knowledge. It is so important for us to make those connections. And this is how we make connections for our students, right? And I put like three different examples here of ways that we can start activating our uh, prior knowledge. A lot of times we go and we say, okay, we ask a question and kind of tie it in, you know, and we do something like that. Well, Today I'm going to challenge you a little bit to think um, and put activities that are really going to make them think, N aside from that just one question that we tend to do at the beginning of the lesson to, to kind of activate and find out what the kids know about a specific topic. Um, so some of these ideas are actually using different um, concept maps or, or uh, diagrams, if you want to call them, but that actually have students participate and engage. So the first one that we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the one that is on the top right hand side, which is called a spider diagram. And in that you put in the middle, right, you could do it in a big chart paper for students, you could do it by tables, you could do it, um, you know, whole class if you would like. Um, I often prefer to put it in, um, in a chart paper um, per table, per smaller groups, right? And put a question or put a, a, a word or a picture, however you want to do it, depending on what, it, what um, concept you are teaching at that particular moment, and putting that, right? And then having the students, don't tell them anything else, just having the students kind of in each of those other boxes or, or areas, allow them to write, draw, paste, just put whatever they know about that concept before we start, right? And this will give you a lot of information. It will tell you about 
misconceptions that the students may have about a topic, um, information that may not be true about a topic, maybe connections that may not be quite there. Um, it will tell you whether or not the students understood the prior information that maybe you taught in another, um, in another unit or whatnot that is pertin pertinent to this particular unit. So we'll give you some ideas as to where they're at. And it will allow them to actually just not feel that, okay, well, I'm gonna copy whatever that person says, okay? They're gonna be, you could do it silently, okay? Or you could do it in a group, right? You can have them talk. And we're gonna talk about, you know, when we talk about language, we're gonna talk about incorporating more um, activities where the students are speaking and listening. They're very important, not just in ELA or Spanish language arts or whatever the case may be. We got to take them all across the content area. So this is a great um, activity that allows students to speak to one another if you want to do, if you design it that way. Another one that we can talk about is silent group retrieval practice, which is this one right here. And in this one, you could do it very different ways, however you would like, right? You could do it in where you would have four students. You would write a concept or a vocabulary word, or in this case, they put anaerobic uh, respiration and fermentation, right? And so then there were, there's four people. Each person has a, um, a space. And the teacher put either pictures or a formula or whatnot. And then the students had to write what they knew about that particular picture in relation to what was in the middle, right? So in this case, right, that we see the bread and we see the, the student running, right? And so what would be their relationship? What do they know in terms of respiration and fermentation? So hopefully they would have some you know, background knowledge regarding this. If not, you would see what they know and what they don't know. You could do it silently, okay? Um, because in that way, it will allow the students just to focus on that and you would see, and then the teacher in something like this would be able to see there's different um, parts here of something that has to do with respiration and fermentation. So you have formulas, you have pictures, you have different things here. And it would really give that teacher a sense as to where her students are, are at based on this information. So this is another one and it's fantastic as you can see. And I put this particular example because you can see that you can use it for your middle school and for your high schoolers as well. Um, because a lot of times we think, oh, it's only for the little munchkins. No, um, we can do this even in the upper grades. And here we have concept maps. So this is one particular concept map that you could use in where you would have students actually help you figure out how they are connecting information. So let's say that in this case, you talked about whales and you talked about fish, right? And you cover this entire, um, part of the concept map before, right? You can have students then kind of figure out how are these all related for and tell you and have those conversations as a class. You could do it that they would have um, pictures and figure out and they can make their own concept map as a group or individually if you like. I like more group activities if possible because it provides that opportunity for students to go ahead and share their thoughts. Um, and I like speaking and listening activities a lot, especially in bilingual education, um, because you could do these in both either English or the target language. So these are very, very um, good. You could, like I said, you could do, this is one that's simple with pictures, right? Um, that you could do, but there's tons of ones that you can maybe do even uh, a little bit fancier for your upper grade students. Any questions thus far? No? Okay. All right. So we're going to do a little poll question, okay? And we're going to think a little bit. We're going we're gonna to pose a little um, 
you know, we're going to reflect on our lesson plans and we're going to think what percentage of the time do, do you include or plan for language instruction within a science lesson? So honestly, we're, this is, this is a, a safe space. So honestly, how many times do you say, okay, I have a science concept and now I'm also going to be teaching language there. So I'll give it a couple more seconds. So it seems like the majority is around 25 ish to maybe half the time, you know, it'll, it'll come up and I'll be like, ah, okay, I'll think about it. Right. Um, well, this is very important for us to know. Right. And why is that? Because when we're teaching, right, remember that in a bilingual classroom, whether if it's TBE or dual language classroom, we're teaching in two languages, right? So we're not only just teaching English, but we're teaching in the majority of cases tends to be Spanish, but we could be teaching Mandarin, we could be teaching Arabic, we could be teaching other um, languages. And it is very important that since we are doing this, right, um, we plan for specific and explicit language instruction, right? And we always think, those of you that have attended other workshops that I've given, remember that I always talk about not only your content objectives, right? We talk about other objectives too. So this is just part of that, thinking about your language instruction. So when we're thinking about language instruction within it, the content, right? we have to incorporate the use of language and content objectives. Sometimes we do do a great job and we're like, okay, they're there or we are able to embed them very quickly or very easily, but sometimes they, they, they require a little bit more thought. Now, the problem is that when we don't do this, right, when we don't specifically um, incorporate language objectives or teach language through content, the problem is that we are doing a disservice to our students. And the reason why I say that is if any of you have looked at any of the, you know, thank goodness we didn't get them this year, right? But any of the state assessments, right? Look at those. Um, they have a lot of language in there. There's a lot. Students have to read and they have to write and they have to comprehend and there's a lot of language there. Even if you don't wanna think about state assessments, but even if you think just about the NISAS lab, there's a lot of language there. There's all four modalities, right? And so we have to ensure that we are teaching this 24 seven to our students. Because if we don't, we're doing a disservice. We're just teaching a content, but we're forgetting that content comes through language, okay? So um, again, providing opportunities for speaking and listening activities, as well as reading and writing. For science, we tend to do a lot of reading and writing, right? We'll, we'll have them jot down or write down or whatever, right? We, we, we have that, they'll read, we do that well, but we often forget those speaking and listening activities. And I often encourage that we, do this even more so sometimes than even the reading or the writing because the reading and the writing will happen. But I feel like the listening and the speaking, they only get listening from, they listen to the teacher, to the teacher, right? They don't listen to each other. They don't get a chance to practice speaking, especially if we're teaching science in Spanish, let's say in the target language, they need to practice using that academic language in that content area in Spanish. So giving them the opportunities to do so, because guess what? If they don't do it in science with you, the probabilities that they're going to be doing it at home are zero to none, right? They're not going to go home talking about photosynthesis in Spanish. 
right? And you laugh, right? But it, think about it. They're not going to go, okay, mommy, yo voy a hablar hoy de fotosíntesis y voy a hablar de, 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 de las mariposas y voy a hablar de todas estas cosas. They don't do that, right? They're not going to talk about that. They're going to go home and talk about Minecraft, right? And they're going to talk about Fortnite. That's what they're going to go home, okay? And that's the problem because then what we tend to see is that as they go through dual language or bilingual or transitional bilingual programs, by the time they get to fifth grade, oh my, they can't move, right? That's, that's when we have that biggest hurdle in the upper grades when they go to middle and high school because the content is so rich, but they don't have that background um, language, really, if you want to call it. They don't have that in their repertoire and they're like, ooh, snap, I, I don't know how to say photosynthesis, even though it's pretty much the same, but you know, I don't know, or I don't know what they're talking about, el ciclo de que se yo, I don't know about any of that. Um, so they need to learn it and then they get kind of stuck and I see it all the time when, when schools or districts want to go from transitional bilingual or they have a dual language program in the elementary levels and then they 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 you know the kids are doing fantastic great they know a lot but then when they when the district or the schools wants to want to move on to the middle school and into the high school uh tbe and expand their their programs or dual language program they they see the kids struggle so much Kids that were getting A's, you know, and doing fantastic in, in elementary school with Spanish, let's say, and then they go to middle school and, oh my goodness, when it came to life science, forget it. They can't do it. They can't. They don't have that language base. So it's up to us to make sure that we are providing those listening and speaking activities, okay? Because they won't get them outside of the classroom. And especially if they're going to take the assessments in, um, in Spanish or the target language, which they can, um, they need to be exposed to all of these activities as well. Okay. Now, I am a very, very big fan of using sentence and paragraph frames. And not only, and especially in content areas, we tend to use them a lot in reading and in writing specifically for ELA, right? We have them there, we'll put them, we'll use them even for SLA. But we often tend to forget a lot about them when it comes to content area. And there's a lot of writing in the content areas and these are very important for us to make sure that we have. So I wanted to share a quick video um, that has a teacher actually uh, using sentence frames and paragraph frames in the science uh, content area. So I want to share that with you guys so that you can get an idea on how you can use these and not only use them, we, we can use them very quickly in English, we might have those in the top of our head, but if we're teaching um, science in Spanish, we need to do these as well. In this segment, we're going to look at sentence frames. Sentence frames are a language tool that can help students think more clearly about science content, communicate more clearly as they write, and improve comprehension as they read. Let's start by considering a lesson on rocks. In keeping with the train style lesson that I discussed in the introductory video, we want the students to do something that gets them interacting with the science, then read something that helps them figure out the big concepts, and then we'll have them write in order to pull together their ideas on what they read and what they did. I place out a pile of interesting rocks, making sure that I include some very clear examples of sedimentary, metamorphic, and igneous rock, and let each child select one to study. Now, I have two purposes for this exploration. I want to make sure that every student sees a variety of rocks, some students don't have a lot of experience with rock. They may have seen gravel and not much else. So in order to understand rock classification, they have to have a bunch of mental images of rocks to work with. Second, I want them to look closely enough at the rocks to see the details that we'll be talking about later. Grain size, striping, 
recognizable sediments and fossils. I'm going to have them use writing to help them look closely and compare rocks. I'll give them a few minutes to study their rocks, draw them, jot down some observations. Then I'm going to ask them to get with a partner and compare their rocks. I'll so I'm going to pause there because as we see these, right, we've seen, we've probably used many of these in our, in our lessons, but it's important that we think that not only can I do it in English, but I could do it also in the target language, right? Eh, oraciones para comparar, ¿verdad? Eh, en blanco es similar a porque las dos blanco, ¿verdad? Muy importante, le podemos poner hasta una, una eh, las palabras de vocabulario, le podemos poner para que entonces hagan dibujos, cosas así. Hay, aquellos de ustedes que han participado en uno de, lo, de los seminarios míos anteriores han visto cómo yo he demostrado esto, cómo yo lo he hecho, ¿verdad? Y es bien importante que tengamos estas, esta, estas oraciones o estos eh, parámetros para que nosotros entonces eh, podamos enseñarle a los estudiantes que no tan solo es cuestión de eh, memorizarse un concepto, sino también hay que poder explicarlo. Y esto es bien, bien importante cuando se trata de eh, enseñar ciencia, ¿verdad? De, y relevante de cuál sea el idioma de que tú, que tú lo vayas a enseñar. Puede ser español, puede ser árabe, puede ser lo que sea. Pero es bien importante que nosotros tengamos estos en mente, y no tan solo que los tengamos en mente, pero también que los podemos entonces diferenciar dependiendo del nivel del estudiante, ya sea que algunos estudiantes pues ya estén un poquito más al, al nivel de entrada, pues entonces pues eso ya tengan otro, otro sistema de, de, de oraciones, ¿verdad? Entonces, y ya aquellos estudiantes que sean un poquito más avanzados, pues entonces tengan otros, otro, otro tipo de ayuda, ¿verdad? No voy a poner el video completo porque era para, para demostrarles lo que pueden hacer, lo que se puede hacer. Y es bien importante, esta es una de, las, de esas cosas que las utilizamos para el inglés, pero muchas veces se nos olvida que esto tenemos que continuarlo a través de todas las materias, no, to, no solamente enseñando inglés. ¿Ok? Deme un brequecito. Porque con toda tecnología siempre hay un problemita que tengo, ¿verdad? Vamos entonces a darle aquí. Y vuelvo otra vez. Ok, volvemos otra vez. Bueno, si está bien con todo el mundo, voy a entonces seguir en español. De, si tienen alguna objeción, por favor, déjenme saber a través del chat para saber si, si estoy hablando un poquito muy rápido. Porque como siempre, aquellos que me conocen, ya voy por la segunda taza de café, así que ya saben que voy es manda por ir para abajo. ¿Ok? Pues entonces, esto es bien importante. Eh, como les dije, pueden seguir, ya yo le puse este, el enlace en, en esta oración, así que pueden, gustosamente, pueden volver otra vez a la presentación y ver el video en su capacidad eh, o en su to totalidad y así pueden entonces coger ideas. Como les dije, esto es algo que se puede eh, no tan solo hacer en inglés, pero que lo pueden hacer en español o cualquier otro idioma que estén enseñando. También otra de las cosas que quiero recalcar es el, la importancia de enseñar aquellas palabras que ya se llaman como Tier 2 o Tier 3. Había aquellas personas que han a, asistido a mi, a mi seminario ya saben que esto también existe, no tan solo en el inglés, pero también existe en el español. Y a ver si alguien se acuerda, a ver si alguien sabe. ¿Cómo es que se llaman esas palabras de tier two? Esas palabras que tienen dos significados o más significados, ¿verdad? Este, dependiendo del contexto, ¿cómo se llaman esas palabras en español? A ver, para la primera trivia del día de hoy, para empezar a, a, a poner la... la el cerebro es funcional, a ver si alguien se acuerda y me lo puede poner en el chat y como siempre, yo siempre ando regalando cositas. A ver, ¿quién se acuerda? ¿Quién se acuerda cómo es que llamamos esas palabras? A ver, vamos a, a sacar así de la, como decía yo de, de, de mi si... Ay, Dios mío. 
este, yo tenía una maestra de español, ¿verdad? Que, 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 que decía las palabras de domingo. A ver si nos acordamos las palabras de domingo, las palabras bien fancy. <ríe> Vamos a ver, a ver, a ver quién. Erika, a ver, ¿alguien, alguien lo dijo, alguien lo dijo. Si ¿Sí puedes repetir la pregunta, por favor. Ah, ok. Pues, ¿cómo es que se llaman? Esta fue que me la estoy tirando ahí porque quiero a ver a ver si se acuerdan. ¿Cómo es que le llamamos a estas palabras que le decimos tier two? Estas palabras que tienen do, varios significados dependiendo del contexto. Pero ¿cómo le decimos esas palabras? Tienen una, tienen dos, tú sabes, una, se llaman de cierta manera en español. ¿Cómo es que le decimos? Y no, no hagan trampa y se metan en Google, mano, en verdad, no hagan trampa. <ríe> que ya los veo diciendo la Phoebe, mira Phoebe, búscame, ¿cómo te llama? Ok, ya los veo, ya los veo, no hagan pilla. Vamos a ver, vamos a ver. Oh, veo, veo los numeritos, veo los numeritos. We have homonyms. Um, no, en español, en español, en español. Después tenemos homofonas. No, <risa> no, <risa> <risa> ¿Qué más? ¿Qué más? Bueno, voy a dar 5, 4, 3. Homónimos. ¿Ah? Homónimos. 2, 1. Bueno, lamentablemente no ganamos, ¿verdad? Pero la contestación es palabras polisémicas. ¿Ok? Las palabras polisémicas son aquellas palabras que tienen varios significados, ¿verdad? Y eso es bien importante porque de la misma manera que lo, lo enseñamos en inglés y, y lo tenemos bien consciente, pero también lo tenemos que tener consciente en español, ¿verdad? Y en otros idiomas también. Eh, yo recientemente, pues aquellos que me conocen, pues ya saben, yo estaba, yo estoy aprendiendo árabe. Y recientemente vi un video en el cual diferentes palabras eh, en árabe tienen diferentes significados dependiendo del país. So, para confundirme aún más de reguero que tengo, ¿verdad? Pues ahora también tengo que aprender que tienen varios significados, ¿verdad? Pues estas palabras se llaman palabras polisémicas que son bien importantes, pero ¿cuál es el, la importancia de esto? Porque cuando estamos hablando de, de diferentes materias o de diferentes contextos, tendemos, especialmente en la ciencia, eh, eh, matemática, cosas así, tendemos a enseñar las palabras que tienen que ver con esa materia, ¿verdad? Esas son las primeritas que, que buscamos, enseñamos y ya. Por ejemplo, la palabra fotosíntesis, cogemos y decimos, ah, fotosíntesis, vamos a aprenderlo, le hacemos que los estudiantes se lo memoricen, lo digan diez mil veces, ¿verdad? Pero se nos olvida que también tenemos que enseñar, por ejemplo, el hecho de que la palabra planta en español tiene varios significados, ¿verdad? Porque la palabra planta, aunque la estemos enseñando, estamos enseñando fotosíntesis, ¿verdad? Que las plantas, pues, reciben la luz y cómo como la, la transfieren y reciben el alimento y todas esas cosas, ¿verdad? Con fotosíntesis, pero eso nos olvida que planta tiene varios significados. Planta puede ser una planta como una planta verde, ¿verdad? En el tema de ciencia, pero también puede ser la planta del pie, ¿ok? Puede también ser una planta de energía, ¿Ok? Y tiene varios significados. Si los estudiantes no han sido expuestos a, a esos varios significados, le puede cambiar la comprensión, como ellos comprenden esa oración, ¿ok? O lo que están hablando. Así que es bien importante, de la misma manera que lo hacemos en inglés, hacerlo en español y saber de que hay esas palabras polisémicas que pueden tener varios significados dependiendo del contexto. ¿Ok? La otra es... Eh, libretas o cuadernos de ciencia interactivo. Esto es como un, como le llamaríamos un journal o algo así, muchos de ustedes ya los utilizan, pero hay veces que se nos olvida eh, incorporarlos en, um, en nuestras rutinas o en nuestras lecciones. Esto es algo que tiene que hacerse desde el principio, no puede ser, hacerse como que de, de la noche a la mañana, ah, pues decidí hacer interactive notebook. No. Esto es algo que desde septiembre, desde el primer día, le enseñamos a los estudiantes cómo utilizar estas libretas o estos cuadernos como de una manera en donde ellos puedan pues, guardar esa información que están aprendiendo. A, depende de la manera que, eh, que, que el maestro quiera, quiera que los estudiantes lo tengan. Ya puede ser que les den la opción de, de los estudiantes poder escribir, este, hacer dibujos, 
todas esas cosas. Miren, esto, esto es un concepto que no es nuevo, no es nuevo, porque inclusive yo, yo tengo mis añitos, ¿verdad? No voy a decir cuánto, este, pero, ¿verdad? Yo me acuerdo de mi maestra, que Missy Farulla, que todavía la tengo en Facebook, es de paso, ¿ok? Missy Farulla era mi maestra de ciencia en cuarto y quinto grado, ¿verdad? Y ella, pues, nos daba estas libretas. Ahora vengo yo a saber, ¿verdad?, que son Interactive Science Notebooks. Pero yo me acuerdo que yo tenía mi libreta de ciencia en el cual ella nos dejaba, ella hacía estos dibujos bien brutales, bien nítidos, mano, una cosa. Entonces, ella nos dejaba que nosotros hiciéramos estos dibujos. Me, me acuerdo que ella le pedía a los papás en la lista, era de que teníamos que tener lápices de colores, teníamos que tener las crayolas también, teníamos que tener todo eso además de tener lápices y era bien importante porque nos dejaba nosotros coger esa información que ya nos estaba y esto era en aquel tiempo, ¿verdad? No voy a decir hace cuánto, ¿verdad? Pero en aquel tiempo que todavía no existían no existía los smartboards, ni los whiteboards, ni nada así por el estilo, era a pizza y pizarra, ¿entiendes? A old school, que tú salías con las manos blancas de, del polvorín de la pizza, ¿verdad? Y te daba unas alelias brutales. Pero en ese tiempo, ¿verdad? Todavía ya existía este concepto y no es un concepto que es nuevo, sin, eh, pero eh, no obstante es un concepto que es súper importante, bien importante cuando estamos hablando de, de, de estrategias que son, que ya las hemos probado, que funcionan, que hacen que al estudiante se le quede esa información. No es tal, miren, eh, si, si no me creen, una de las cosas es que yo todavía me acuerdo a mis tantos, ¿verdad? Años, me acuerdo todavía de los dibujos que nosotros hacíamos de la célula, ¿ok? Y me acuerdo, y todavía me acuerdo, porque todavía tengo eso grabado de yo haberle hecho esos dibujitos en mi libreta cuando mi cifarulla nos enseñaba. Y me acuerdo núcleo y todas esas cosas, eh, todavía lo tengo aquí. Grabado, puedo cerrar los ojos y acordarme de eso. Así que funciona, porque hace que los estudiantes tengan ese, ese contacto un poco más directo que simplemente memorizar un montón de conceptos. Así que si no lo han tratado honestamente, que es algo bien, eh, bien barato, no, no cuesta mucho, muchas veces nos podemos, si los estudiantes no tienen acceso a una libreta, podemos comprarla, ¿verdad? Las tienen usualmente a, a, como decimos nosotros en Puerto Rico, a pesteta, ¿verdad? O la tienen a 25 centavos, 50 centavos, o bien, bien baratitas las tenemos. Y los estudiantes, honestamente, eh, las disfrutan. Eso sí, tenemos que enseñarles desde un principio cómo utilizarlas y cómo entonces ellos pueden captar toda la información que estamos enseñándoles. Bueno, como les había dicho, pues entonces están las palabras polisémicas. Esto es otro ejemplo. Aquí tenemos una palabra que es la palabra pico y la palabra planta, ¿verdad? Y estas son eh, palabras que, como les dije, se llaman palabras polisémicas y representan o tienen varios significados dependiendo del contexto. Esto es un video que le, no se lo voy a enseñar, pero es un video muy importante que tiene una actividad inclusive este, que les enseña diferentes palabras polisémicas y sus significados. Por ejemplo, cuando estamos hablando del pico, ¿verdad? De un animal, de un pájaro, ¿verdad? Se llama el pico, la boca, ¿verdad? Entonces, pero también tenemos que saber que el pico puede ser el pico de una montaña. Así que si estamos ten, eh, teniendo una clase de Earth Science, ¿verdad? Pues eso es bien importante porque un estudiante se va a recordar, ah, sí, el pico de, de, del águila. Pero no es lo mismo, estamos hablando del pico de una montaña. Así que imagínense, el, si el estudiante solamente tiene un significado de la palabra pico, ¿verdad? Pues, ¿qué pasa? Solamente está haciendo la, eh, la conexión con qué, con la boca de un pájaro y no está haciendo la conexión con el pico de una montaña. O si, si, si ha escuchado, bueno, son las cinco y pico, ¿verdad? Que, que hay veces que decimos las cinco y pico, five -ish. las cinco y pico, ¿verdad? Pues eso también es otro significado de la palabra pico, ¿ok? Bien importante. Voy a pausar aquí, Erika, ¿tenemos alguna preguntita, algún comentario? La única pregunta fue que si se puede hacer por unidad. Eh, ¿Qué se puede hacer por unidad? Las palabras... No. Claudia, si quieres, um, puedes... Sí, Ajá. Explícame un poquito ah. más a qué te refieres, Claudia. Es um, porque 
cuando yo he estado enseñando ciencia, no siempre uso el interactivo okay. como, como lo muestran. Porque yo lo cambio solamente dependiendo de las palabras por unidad. Yo enseño sexto, entonces es, de, estamos hablando de, del ciclo de agua, estamos hablando de química, estamos hablando un poco de física. Entonces, yo lo he cambiado. Entonces, yo quiero saber si es posible cambiarlo por unidad, diga, el modo que lo presentamos a los estudiantes. Eh, ¿Tú dices la libreta o tú dices...? La libreta, la, la libreta. La, la libreta. Mira, esto es... Lo, lo bueno de todo esto es que esto es a tu discreción, ¿ok? Y eso es lo nítido. Es después de que tenga eh, pues un propósito académico y cuál es ese propósito. Y después de que no confunda mucho a los estudiantes, pues eso también es la otra, ¿verdad? Porque hay veces que, que nos podemos a, a hacer súper fancy, ¿verdad? Como yo digo yo, ¿verdad? Y pues se nos... <ríe> lo que tenemos un montón de libretas y después no, ninguno las utiliza, ¿verdad? Eh, hay muchas maneras de, de hacerlo, yo lo que sugiero es que las intenten, ¿me entiendes? Y veas cómo te va. Yo creo que cada clase es distinta, eh, hay algunos estudiantes que pues prefieren tenerlo organizado pues por unidad, eso también lo puedes hacer, es muy fácil. Um, o oh, otros estudiantes prefieren tenerlos todos juntos. Yo creo que es, es a tu discreción y también es a tu presupuesto, ¿verdad? Porque pues vamos a ser honestos. Eh, muchas veces eh, esto, esto sale del bolsillo de uno <risa> y el presupuesto, como decimos, ¿verdad? En Puerto Rico la piña a veces que está un poco agria y pues este <risa> no da para mucho, ¿verdad? Así que pues eh, yo encuentro que, que todo depende del presupuesto tuyo también y el propósito académico y también tus estudiantes, ¿cuál, es, cuál va a ser el que va a rendir el mejor este éxito para tus estudiantes en, en, en cuanto a ellos puedan utilizarlo. Así que honestamente yo te yo te, te exhorto a que los trates y veas a ver cuál te sale mejor, ¿entiendes? Y veas a ver, eh, ¿tienes alguna idea de cuál tú crees que estás más, o sea, si quieres tratar más la unidad o quieres tratar, eh, hay alguno que tienes una preferencia y el por qué? Uh, yo lo he hecho en ambos. Um, okay. Yo lo he hecho en el sentido de que hacemos el interactivo y ellos lo cortan, lo pegan en el, en la, en el cuaderno y ponen las definiciones como un matching game, uh -huh. a dónde cae. Yo también he hecho que yo les he dado um, las palabras y ellos lo cortan y lo ponen alfabéticamente porque yo solo hago un word scramble en el sentido para que ellos vayan practicando su alfabeto. Y después les digo que deje espacio porque mientras que vamos durante el curso de, esa, de ese tema, yo les voy diciendo, ok, pongan estas oraciones debajo para que hagan más la conexión. Entonces, yo los he tratado en diferentes formas, pero todo depende de, del tema que hemos estado cubriendo en ese momento y, y en la unidad. Ok. Pues sí, pues nada, tú, yo, yo te inculco a que tú los trates y veas a ver cuál es el que te funciona mejor dependiendo de la unidad o dependiendo del, del caso, ¿verdad? Este, otra, gracias por compartir. Eh, otras estrategias que pueden utilizar también, miren, una de las que a mí me fascina y yo lo he hecho en el salón de clase, me fascina porque los estudiantes se sienten como que, ay, mira mi trabajo, mira qué cool. Eh, es este que estamos aquí, esto, esto es lo que llaman The Interactive World Rules, ¿verdad? En donde los estudiantes son los que están haciendo, están poniendo las palabras, están diseñándolo todo, pero a la misma vez ellos son responsables de, de lo que están poniendo ahí. Obviamente, pues, la maestra o el maestro está, eh, está monitoreando, ¿verdad?, que la información esté correcta, pero ellos son los que están creando este mural y para ellos tiene más significado, eh, eh, es más significativo para ellos que simplemente nosotros hacer un word boy, poner la palabra ahí y ya, y se acabó, ¿verdad? Esto para ellos, pues, significa un poco más y volvemos otra vez que estamos entonces incorporando otras modalidades estamos incorporando eh, escritura, estamos incorporando si lo hacemos este, por grupos, ellos están hablando, están escuchando, están practicando diferente, están leyendo, así que las cuatro modalidades las están practicando en una cosa como esa. Y si vamos a pensar, ¿verdad? Un, un bulletin board menos que hacer, <ríe> ¿verdad? Porque los estudiantes ya te lo están haciendo. Así que esto es bien, bien importante. Otras de que tenemos aquí, tenemos algunas preguntitas o algunos, este, eh, como le llaman, question starters, 
¿verdad? Donde entonces podemos hacer que los estudiantes tengan esa conversación y es bien importante cuando estamos hablando de ciencias que empiecen a pensar críticamente y vamos a hablar un poquito más de eso, pero por ejemplo, eh, cuando se trata de predecir, yo predigo que eh, en el experimento va a ser tal, 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 este va a ser el resultado. ¿Y por qué? ¿Cuál es tu hipótesis? ¿Cuáles todas esas cosas? Y están utilizando, volvemos otra vez, escribir, eh, leer, están utilizando todas las modalidades porque la puedes hacer de distintas maneras. Puedes tener la conversación con los estudiantes a la vez que también lo puedes hacer que ellos también lo escriban o lo lean. Otras cosas, a mí me encanta, y esto ya yo lo he dicho en otro, en otro, en otro seminario, a mí me encanta cuando los estudiantes producen los llamados este, charts, ¿verdad? Eh, yo creo que significa mucho más para ellos, ellos pueden hacer una, una conexión eh, más permanente al contexto, a lo que se está eh, explicando cuando ellos son los que están haciendo todo esto. Esto es uno de un hábitat saludable, ¿verdad? Pues los niños ahí mismo, ellos pusieron todas las cosas, por ejemplo, agua fría, oxígeno, todas esas cosas, y después pusieron todas lo, pusieron animales, quiénes van a estar ahí, la comida, todas esas cosas, y para ellos ahora, pues es algo que ellos están orgullosos de haber hecho, y es algo que ellos van a estar más conscientes de mirar a, ¿verdad? Porque ellos lo hicieron, a ellos les gusta su trabajo. Otra de las actividades que a mí también me gusta es hacer eh, juegos. Y vamos a hablar un poquito más de ellos eh, eh, prontito, pero una de las cosas es, aquí tenemos un tic-tac-toe de rocas metamórficas en el cual todas las actividades que están aquí, los estudiantes tienen que hablar y el otro tiene que escuchar, ¿verdad? Entonces, pues, por ejemplo, aquí en el primero dice, what is a, 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 um, a mineral? Y cuáles al dos son, eh, son dos... Eh, Do, dos, eh, dos minerales comunes, ¿verdad? Pues el, el estudiante tiene que decirle esto al compañero antes de poner la X o el cero. Eh, y, y pues tienen que entonces, y volvemos otra vez, speaking and listening, ¿verdad? Tienen que hablar y tienen que escuchar. Y es bien importante. A mí me encantan actividades así. Y en mi salón, cuando yo era maestra, en mi salón siempre había un reguero de... de, de la, mi, la, la principal, así se empezó, todos entraban y siempre decía, Dios mío, tus nenes nunca se callan, ¿verdad? Serán como, serán como la maestra. Pero es porque a mí me gusta que ellos hablaran mucho y eso es bien importante porque sabemos muy bien como maestras de lenguaje, ¿qué pasa? Que los estudiantes aprenden el, el lenguaje como escuchándolo, ¿verdad? Como los bebés, escuchándolo, mientras más escuchen, más ellos pueden ¿qué? Hablarlo. Eh, así que si sí, lo pensamos de esa manera. Ok, pues vamos a, entonces a tener una preguntita aquí en la cual ustedes pueden poner en su en, en el chat box, ¿verdad? ¿verdad? Este, ¿Cuáles estrategias ¿verdad? ustedes incorporan en sus lecciones de ciencia para asegurarse de que estamos entonces enseñando eh, responsablemente cuando se trata eh, de las culturas, lenguaje y todo eso? Okay, lo voy a decir. I'm going to switch it up to English a little bit now. So what strategies do you incorporate in your science lessons to ensure that they are culturally responsive? All right, vamos a, let's see, now this is a time where we are going to kind of share some of the things that we have done. Um, and if you haven't, that is totally okay. That is why we are here today to kind of learn uh, more on how we can do this in our Uh, science lessons so that we can be, we can touch upon that social cultural competency um, goal that bilingual education has. Uh, do we have any comments on the chat box? So far we have um, using TPR, right, total physical response. Um, and we also have clarifying misconceptions. Okay. Uh, one more. Uh, yeah, someone said, you know, asking for, for other terminology that they uh, recognize, uh, okay. repetition, visuals. Okay, and those are all great ideas, but we're going to dive a little bit deeper. So let me, let me um, go on to the next slide and what am I talking about when it comes to um, making those connections for students uh, with experiences, cultures, and language. And um, so 
in my previous uh, webinars, I have talked about the importance, and even in this one, I've talked about the importance of not just only the, co the content objectives, right? We talked about the language objectives, but we're gonna talk about the cultural objectives. And if you wanna think about the way that we do this, is content is the what, language is the how, and cultural objectives is the bridge. How are we gonna bridge it from the content to the students' experiences and lives, right? So that is what we think about. And again, this is not something that is mandated by your administrators or supervisors, but this is something that is going to make the content meaningful for your students, and especially in a bilingual or TBE or dual language classroom culture. You cannot teach language in a vacuum, right? You have to teach it through culture. So we can't forget this. Right, um, so incorporating those bridges, how am I going to bridge this from my students' experiences, right? And we have to know our students for this. And how am I going to go ahead and bridge that content so that it makes sense to them, so it's tangible. So creating activities that allow students to make connections to their daily experiences and surroundings is very important. Creating homework assignments, right now we're, in that weird time of the year that we're fried, right? As teachers, we're, we're, we're done, stick a fork on us, right? And as students, trust you me, they're extra fried right now. They are done, they, they don't wanna think, they're thinking about summer, you know, it's getting nice outside, although we can't go out too much, but at least something, the sun is out, you know? So, um, you know, they, they're thinking like that. So. Creating, I think that a great time right now is creating homework assignments and projects that allow family members to contribute. So they, these are great because then they can bring in their culture, their language, and all these experiences and make it important for them. As well as creating opportunities that allow students to showcase their language repertoire. So remember, we've talked about the differences in language. In Spanish, there's so many different accents. Oh my goodness, it's the beauty of, of Spanish. It's beautiful. It has so many different accents. And I think that we have to celebrate that and we have to make sure that if we allow students to also showcase their language repertoires, and especially in dual language classrooms, where we can have students that come from other backgrounds as well that are not Spanish speaking homes, hey, or the target language homes, we celebrating that and making sure that we incorporate that. Someone mentioned about, you know, how they say a, maybe a term in their, in their home language. That's a great way to start with this, right? And creating opportunities for translanguaging spaces and activities. Again, I have mentioned, and if you haven't um, heard this from me before, translanguaging is great. It's, it sometimes gets a bad rap. But I think that the key for translanguaging um, is that, or any activity is that has a, it has to be meaningful and purposeful. So it has to be planned. No, no lo vamos a sacar de la manga, okay? No es a lo loco, no es al garete, okay? It's not just, hey, right? No, it has to have a purpose, right? To giving and preparing these um, spaces for students to be able to really tap into their entire language repertoire. So, how am I going to do this? So I'm, I put here, this is not an end all to be all. These are some of the strategies that we could do to ensure that we are doing some social cultural competency when it comes to science. Um, highlighting, a lot of times, right? A lot of times when we talk about science, it comes from a white Eurocentric perspective and it's often male. Okay, if you haven't thought about that, but it does. So highlighting. So if you're going to talk about, let's say, I don't know, um, um, give me a science concept, I'm drawing a blank here. But if you're thinking of a science concept, hey, think about if there are particular people of achievement of various racial and ethnic or gendered or age groups that you know, you can incorporate. So instead of thinking about, you know, since we already, as I mentioned, science is written from a white Eurocentric male perspective, 
hey, incorporating women, women of color, indigenous women, okay? These make it more tangible for students. Uh, assigning students to investigate and find out, a lot of times the students don't even know. So assigning them um, to go and do a little bit of research, right? Um, it's, it's a fantastic way to start. Um, often we just leave it for uh, Hispanic Heritage Month or we leave it for Asian American Heritage Month and we just leave it for a specific, you know, um, Black History Month. We only leave it for those specific months, right? And we forget it that it's year round. Um, so this is a great way to start. Another one is that I love and I, again, this is something that is not new. It's, it's kind of a little old school because I used to, um, I actually remember a specific, and I'll, I'll, talk, to, I'll talk about that one, um, focus on how specific cultural groups think about science and how society shapes it, because it's very different, right? The Western way of thinking about science might not be the same way that other countries think about it. So um, there's actually the Cradle Board Project that it has a lot of resources, especially for science, and it's based on Native American knowledge, right? Um, there, I, a clear example, I still remember how we had, it was in third grade, and we had a, a trip, a field trip to one of the National Museums of Taino Heritage in Puerto Rico. And we then were talking about, we learned how they use certain plants for medicine purposes, right? And some of these plants are used still to this day. Like, for example, Malagueta, the seed of Malagueta, if anybody knows about Alcolado or um, Alcolado Superior 70, it's, it actually smells horrible but <laughs> a lot of you know like my grandmother swears by it right um vix vapor up right okay <laughs> we know that one okay and that one believe it or not but it had some indigenous um background and so making that link between culture and something that we use nowadays and how that is still if you think about it that menthol right it comes from a leaf Okay, so see the connection, and it's used right in your in your cough drops that you that you buy nowadays, and in a lot of medicine that you have, right? So it's still there. Um, another one is making connections with uh, multicultural education with environmental justice, and the Three Circle Center for Multicultural Environmental Education has great resources there. So check them out. I've I've hyperlinked all of these to there. Um, there's a uh, making sure that we um, have access to for science for all students. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause here for a minute and talk a little bit about this because if you did not know, but oftentimes, even us as, if we could be female or male, it doesn't matter. But oftentimes when, when it comes to science and uh, math, girls are often left behind. Okay, so statistically, we tend to call on boys and preference boys, okay, more so in science and math than we do girls, okay? So, and I, for me, it was eye-awakening. I had a classroom visitation one time, and it was a bunch of teachers, and they noted down how many times I called on my male students versus my female students, depending on the con uh, content that I was teaching, and it was mind bottling. And it made me be more reflective about it. Um, so a lot of times we often mark it even just the way uh, like uh, after school activities such as STEM um, groups and things like that, we often marketed them more so to males than to females. That is why in the science industries, we do have more males than we do females. Um, so it's very important, it starts in school. Um, because of that, I found this, uh, that actually I am, I have the, I am so excited about this uh, tool, is the National Science Teaching Association, okay? 
So they have in there, um, they have other resources and things that you can um, look for, not only for elementary, but also for your middle and high school. And another one in terms of making connections to culture, like for example, if you have students um, that, if you're talking about hurricanes, right? And you have students from Puerto Rico, the Caribbean, let me tell you something, they will probably write an entire thesis, okay, on hurricanes. Because we get this from the, the time that we're in the womb. And so making those connections and imagine how important and how valuable it is for students when they become the experts, it is amazing. Um, because they can tell you um, everything from how to prepare to the latitude and longitude, which by the way, they do teach that in the Caribbean at an early age. They teach you how to, you know, find where the hurricane is coming. Okay. And it is so important. And the kids see, oh my goodness, I am an expert. I am an expert. I may not know a lot of English or I may not know a lot of Spanish or whatever the case may be, but I'm an expert in that. Okay. So talking about them brings a lot of value for students. And I hyperlink to uh, different activities that have to do that with that. Um, so as I mentioned before, right, we had six points that we were talking about. We've discussed three of them. Now we're going into number four, which is exploration, experimentation, and demonstration, which are so, 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 so important. And I think that even now, so that we are doing um, remote slash virtual slash distance teaching or learning, um, we are doing more so than we maybe would have done before, right? We, we tended to rely more on the books and things like that, on the textbooks. But now that maybe the textbook is not available digitally or we've had to reinvent everything, we're using a lot more videos. And this is so important. I want you to, even if we go back, um, I don't know, whatever capacity, whatever that may look like in September. Um, yeah, you know, because I, I can't even say that anymore. But in any case, when we get back to the classroom, um, uh, I want you to continue with this mindset of demonstrations, exploration, and experiment, experimentation. And I need you guys to think about like that, uh, think about it that way so that you continue to provide those experiences for your students. I am a big fan of games. Uh, those of you that have uh, attended other webinars with me know that I love games. And yes, there is a game today. Yes, there is. Um, so add games to your lessons. And I've actually hyperlinked a lot of these to, um, to this uh, webinar. So you can just click and get ideas. Incorporate outdoor games. There's a lot of ideas of incorporating outdoor games for science for your students. And these are great because some of these ideas, you can actually incorporate them right now that students can do at home, okay, with their parents. And they're, they're inexpensive um, and they're very easy to follow. Um, you have science experiments, science experiments for home and school biology experiments for my older kids, right? The experiment game, uh, Generation Genius, it's great. Okay, I'm going through these because there's one in particular that I wanna share. Um, and I wanna actually uh, make it uh, very well known. The one that I told you about the podcast every month, okay, is the NASA Stars en Español. And they actually do the podcast in Spanish every month and it's actual people that are working, Latinos that are working right now in NASA, and they talk about different topics. Um, so it's really cool, and you can even sign up and all that good stuff. So it's really, really awesome. They have Science Friday in Español. This is my favorite. I love it, love it, love it, because it kind of tackles everything. It tackles um, the social cultural competency component. It tackles language because it's in Spanish, right? And then it also just tackles the demonstration, experimentation, and exploration. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna play it very quickly. Can you, can you all see it? 
now let me let me share again gotta love technology when it works now better okay all right so this is science girls and if i know it is by pbs okay and they have they have like five seasons okay so this is just one that i found that was really really cute um they're talking about arboles and um and the ec uh ecosystem and all that so so i'm gonna play it not the whole thing but just a little bit vamos a hacer una investigación de donde vamos a comparar los beneficios de los árboles grandes en el bosque con los beneficios de los árboles grandes en la ciudad los árboles son muy importantes porque sin ellos no podemos sobrevivir Major funding for SciGirls is provided by the National Science Foundation, supporting education and research across all fields of science and engineering. The National Science Foundation, where discoveries begin. Additional funding is provided by... Explorar y construir cosas. Mis padres esperan que algún día me convierta en una científica o ingeniera. Y mira esto, más chicas que les gustan las mismas cosas que a mí. ¡Vamos! La ciencia e ingeniería son para ti. Anímate, tú puedes. Mi escuela es lo que nosotros llamaríamos una ecoescuela. Se enfoca mucho en la ciencia, especialmente en la área de la naturaleza y de conservar nuestro, pues, nuestro planeta. Isabel y Gabriela están en la misma escuela que yo. Yo soy Carla. Me gusta mucho las playas, me gusta mucho salir a la bosque. Me llamo Gaby. Me gusta mucho el bosque, ya que no solamente vemos eh, árboles, también hay criaturas. Podemos ver ciertos tipos de aves, insectos, ranas. Y es como estar en armonía, como no estar en el bosque. Yo soy Isabel. A mí me gustan mucho este, los ríos que hay en la isla porque a mí me gusta ir a los ríos mucho de poder meterme y, y también a los lagos. El piso está bastante húmedo porque, como saben, estuvo lloviendo toda la mañana. Amelia es una bióloga que vino desde su trabajo a nuestra escuela a enseñarnos sobre, más sobre los árboles que hay en el ecosistema y dentro del edificio de la escuela. ¿Qué cosas nos dan las plantas? Sí, no. Nos dan oxígeno, sí, no. comida, son, son vegetación, son para comer. Son las para utilizamos ahí. para comer. Así que las plantas son bien importantes en nuestra vida. Podemos aprender cosas nuevas de las plantas y plantas nuevas. Eh, también cuáles son los beneficios que esas plantas grandes dan a su ecosistema, a su bosque. Tenemos un árbol bien grande, eh, es como nuestro árbol, el árbol de Cedín. Es parte de la escuela, es como el estudiante más viejo de la escuela. Yo diría... So, así que voy a pausar, voy a hablar entonces ahora en español. Voy a pausar el video porque el video obviamente es de 30 minutos, pero lo que quería mostrarle a ustedes es que no tan solo lo bueno de, este, de, este, de esta página, es que tienen, como les dije, tienen ya cuatro temporadas, cuatro o cinco temporadas, tienen videos de distintas, eh, de distintos temas. Y lo que me encanta es que expone a los estudiantes, ¿ok? A distintos acentos del español. Porque tienen estudiantes de toda Latinoamérica y de diferentes partes de Estados Unidos. Entonces, y habla de diferentes cosas y también a la misma vez, Volvemos y, y recalcamos que entonces lo pone de un enfoque de niñas, porque usualmente muchas de las niñas, pues como ya sabemos estadísticamente, pues las niñas no, no son incorporadas al mismo nivel que los estudiantes varones. Así que a mí me encantó esto, pueden chequearlo, pueden, pueden mirar, este, y es por Emmy, eh, ya se han ganado un Emmy, este es de PBS y tiene un montón de otras cosas ahí, también existe en inglés, así que si están haciendo la clase de ciencia en inglés, también la pueden buscar por Science Girls um, obviamente no en español, pero Science Girls y la puede, y pueden consig eh, conseguir este, esta página también, pero yo encontré que esto, esto era fantástico a mí me, a mí me fascinó, porque la, las muchachas son las que están explicando los diferentes temas y cómo ellas 
también están aprendiendo a la misma vez que están explicando. Y yo encuentro que eso para, eh, para los estudiantes siempre es bien importante porque cuando ellos aprenden de, de sí mismos, pues es cuando también tienden a hacer esas conexiones aún mejor que si nosotros pues somos los que estamos hablando todo el tiempo, ¿verdad? Vamos a hacer, eh, déjame darle el, el pause, como todo, ¿verdad? Tengo que darle aquí. Ahí se me fue. Ahora, ya volvemos otra vez. Ok, entonces, como les mencioné eso, pues entonces les recalco que, que vayan y chequen todas estas diferentes páginas porque son muchas, muchas, muchas ideas que son bien buenas eh, y les van a dar muchas ideas de cómo, de cómo hacerlo. Hay algunos que tienen hasta este experimentos que ya pueden hacerlo, que si les cambian el lenguaje, pues ya lo tienen en español y todo eso. Pues como les había mencionado, es hora de jugar un juego porque a mí me encantan los juegos y yo encuentro que es la mejor manera que uno aprende porque cuando haces que la, la instrucción o el aprendizaje sea divertido, ahí es cuando nosotros aprendemos aún mejor. Así que voy a ponerlo aquí porque se me olvidó ponerlo de, de la otra manera. Así que aquellas personas que han jugado Guess the Picture o Adivina eh, la foto, ¿verdad? pues van a tener una oportunidad de hacerlo. Y como estamos hablando de ciencia, pues obviamente tiene que ver con animales. Así que vamos a jugar un jueguito. Y como siempre, hay premios que ganar. Y yo, como buena niña, escucha que soy Girl Scout Honor, right? um, Siempre saben que ya, ya tiene, y aquellos que me conocen ya saben que es de, de Target o de Starbucks, ¿verdad? Y el gift card viene por eh, correo electrónico. Y les llega, les llega, le prometo, le prometo. Um, así que van a adivinar, eh, las fotos es a través de como que las han ampliado, ¿verdad? Le han dado como un zoom, así que no son tan fáciles de adivinar. La cosa es, como lo vamos a jugar es que ustedes tienen que utilizar el, eh, el dibujito, ¿verdad? De, de, de raise your hand, de levantar la mano de zoom, así que vamos a practicar un ratito aquí a que que todo el mundo pueda levantar la mano para saber que saben cuál es ese, ¿verdad? Cuando sepan el nombre. Entonces, Erika, yo la voy a poner a trabajar hoy, bendito. Pero ella es la que me va a decir, ok, ella es la que me va a decir, este, ella va, me, me va a mantener la tabulación de los puntos para saber quién va a ganar, ¿verdad? Y las primeras tres personas, los primeros tres lugares, pues esos son los ganadores del día de hoy. ¿Alguna preguntita? Tenemos al pregunta. No lo voy a hacer correr en las casas todavía. Hoy no, hoy no. Quizás otro día, otro día. Este, ¿Estamos bien? ¿Estamos listos? Practicamos. Vamos a practicar el, el hand raising. How do you place your hand in the video? Es en el, es en la, en el tool, tool, toolbox, es como se llama, ¿verdad? El toolbox que está arriba de, de Zoom o abajo a veces. Que dice... Donde dice participants, ahí se puede, ahí lo tiene que abrir a esa cajita primero. Y después puedes um, usar okay. la mano. Es un participante, gracias. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Lo viste, ok. ¿Todo el mundo lo tiene? ¿Vamos bien? Ok. Bueno, pues listo. Vamos a empezar entonces. La primera foto. ¿Qué es? Veo, veo, ¿qué ves? Una cosa. Ah. Elvis Rosario, yo creo que fue el primero, ¿verdad? Elvis, ¿qué? Unmute yourself. Elvis. That's an amoeba. No. A jellyfish. A jellyfish, sorry, Janet, sorry. A jellyfish. Janet. A jellyfish. <laughs> Janet te ganó en eso, así que Janet okay. tiene el punto, Janet tiene el punto. Pero está bien, está bien, there's more, there's more. Ok, ok, muy bien, vamos a ver. Eh, Erika, tú me, tú me mantienes la tabulación ahí. Ok, vamos al próximo. Claudia fue la Tortuga. primera. No, espérate. Claudia, ¿tú fuiste la primera? Claudia, ya. Yeah. Sí. ¿Qué fue, oh. Claudia? Turtle. Turtle, ¿verdad? El caparazón de una tortuga. Muy bien, muy bien. Ok, ¿veis bien, Jean? Ok. Uh. Crocodile. Yeah. Espérate, espérate, espérate. 
Let me, who was the first one? Kaying. Who? Kaying. Okay. It's a crocodile skin. Yes, it's it's actually a, an alligator, which are my um, my unwanted neighborhood neighbors in um, in Florida. I don't like them, but they're here, and I don't like them. So yes, it is an alligator, or I'll accept crocodile. All right, all right, let's go. Janette Nuevo. <laughs> Janet, yeah, Janet is on a roll today. <laughs> Frog's eye. It is a frog. It is a frog. Yes, it is a frog's eye. Very good. Very good. And man, I thought I was making them hard. I even had my mom like get them and she was like, I don't know. I don't know. I like to play this game. So I do it with my class. <laughs> ah, up, babe. You've been practicing. Hold up. All right, bien. Oh, Janet. Janet. Uh-huh. The bird. No, it's not. It's oh, not okay. That. So it's the face of a dog. I'm sorry. I, I just saw the whiskers. No. No. Kenda. Kendi, espérate. ¿Quién gritó? Espérate. ¿Quién es? I just see iPhone. Me, Kimberly. 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 Yes. All right. All right. Yes, it is a panda. Panda, 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 right? All right. Okay. Espérate. All right. Next one. Raise your hand, Danette. Yeah, to Danette, you're on a roll. <laughs> Clownfish? No, it's not. La próxima fue Melissa. Um, uh, era Melissa? No. Uh-oh. Kimberly. Yeah, I raised it. Melissa, I think it went Melissa. back down. Oh, okay, yeah, Melissa. it did go down. What was it, Melissa? Melissa what was is it? that a giraffe? Yes, ma'am. It is a giraffe. You know, beautiful. All right, the next one. My goodness, I thought I was making them hard. And I think for the next one, I'm going to have. All right. Claudia again. <laughs> Claudia. Oh, I, I lost it. Don't know. Don't know. Right. Uh, Hi, you're next. Hi's iPhone. Uh, a bird. Mm, Others. You got it. You got it. You got to be a little specific. Uh, specific on the bird. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> um. Oh, geez. What type of bird? A parrot? I don't know. No, sorry. No. Yes, you're next, Enos. Enos, you're next. A monkey, but it's not. Never mind. No, it's not, Enos. Sorry. Diana? <laughs> is it a toucan? Yes, ma'am. It is. Yay. <laughs> toucan, Sam. Yes, it is. Thank you. All right. This one. I love Ines face right now. She is like looking at that light. We have uh, Melissa. Melissa, what do you think? Um, I think two things, but I'm going to go with my first one. Is it an owl? Yes. All right. Wow. <laughs> wow. I was mildly obsessed with owls like a few years I back. Can tell. I can tell. Because <laughs> I was like, girl, <laughs> wow. Okay. All right. Next one. Jeanette. <laughs> Jeanette, mama bell. Snake? Yes, and they're disgusting and I hate them. Mm -hmm. And I found one in my backyard because that is one of the lovely things that you get in Florida. Ah. <laughs> yes, it is a snake. <laughs> All right. And that was it. So what are our points? Who do we got? Who are our three winners? I think Jeanette is one of them. I'm going to assume on that one. And Melissa, I think. <laughs> I think, um, well, Jeanette definitely uh, was the top. And then we also had, um, I think Claudia got more than once. Yeah. Um, and Claudia, then. I think Melissa was the other one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And you know, you um, if you don't know, now you know um, the, the rules. Okay. Um, how to cash in your prize. So. Um, please, please, please make sure that you send me your email. Send me your email, okay? Don't send it to Erica. Send it to me, as, uh, Suzanne Penna at smpedconsulting.com. Send me an email and uh, so that I have your email address. Um, 
full name, please, so that I can have it because I have to set up the, the gift card and then let me know, um, Starbucks or Target, um, you know, um, and, uh, and yeah, let me know which one you would like. Okay. Thank you guys for participating. I thought I made them hard, but next time I'm going to have to make this, this game harder. Um, you should have seen my mom. My mom was like, literally, she was like, I don't get it. Don't say, I don't know any of these. I can't know how. So yeah, I try all my games out with my family members first. So <laughs> anywho, so let's continue with the next one. So now going to point number five, um, develop and encourage critical thinking. And this is so important because especially in science, I think it's one of those subject areas that we just kind of like, right? A lot of information to the students. We talk to them and we tell them a lot of, of, of um, concepts and things and we just give them, give them, give them, give them the information. But we often don't plan, right? And a lot of, I, I think that a lot of the textbooks don't, um, do such a great job in my, in my opinion, they don't do such a great job to allow students to develop these questioning and, uh, critiquing techniques, right? They don't let them think critically and, and get to a conclusion, right? It makes them more like, this is A, this is B, this is C. Okay. And what should come next? Okay. Yeah, it's C. Um, and so it's kind of just there. So I think that when we are planning, it is very important that we have more, develop more of these skills for students. And we do so through speaking and listening, right? We develop those question techniques, how to ask a question. We don't even think about this because it's not one of the science, you know, targets or, or standards or whatever you want to call it, right? It's not one of them. But we have to, there's a certain way that you ask a question and a certain way that you answer a question, right? So, and then having a discussion, this is very important and having a discussion and disagreeing maybe with a partner on their conclusion or their hypothesis. Why do you think X, Y, and Z? And then providing the evidence for that. So having these discussions and preparing these activities for the students so that they can have these discussion in either English or the target language. Honestly, if you haven't tried it already in Spanish I, or the target language, I really, really, really challenge you to do so because you're going to start seeing where the gaps are for your students. Um, and you're going to be like, Ooh, man, I gotta, I gotta think about something like that. Or I gotta think of, uh, of teaching my kids more about this. Um, then linking, we've already talked about this linking science concept to real life issues so that the students see the correlation. I mean, I don't think that there's a more relevant topic right now than, you know, COVID or Corona or coronavirus. That is a science topic, you know, and especially for our older kids and even for younger ones, because they've heard it, they're, they're, they know something. There's ways that we can talk about that topic and relating it maybe to germs, viruses, you know, all of these things, that is how we connect it to real life situations. And it is very important. If you're talking about biology, right? And you're talking about viruses, there's a simple connection right there um, of how this can be done. And I encourage you to step out of the box of memorization. Science is so, a lot of times is memorizing a lot of uh, tier three words that have to do with science and we have the kids memorize a bunch of words and we do the little matches and we do all of these things and they memorize this, but they forget, they don't make the links and they don't uh, question and they don't critique and they don't discuss. And so it becomes kind of like just knowledge that they lose. What they learned two minutes ago, it has nothing to do you know, um, with, with, they don't make those connections to knowledge that they're going to gain later on. They're like, Oh yeah, I, I don't remember that. I, I remember that. I talked about that in like in seventh grade. I don't remember that. Right. But it's actually, we need to make those connections for the kids and we need to stop looking at science the way that it's kind of written, uh, on the textbooks. We got to think a little bit more than just memorization. And so 
using a, uh, the last one is the use of technology for demonstrations. We have this and we, we talked a little bit about some um, in my uh, other webinar where uh, I had a lot of video, um, a lot of tools for remote learning, for digital learning. I talked about uh, some for science there, but here's some other ones that I wanted just to kind of um, highlight that are very, very important and actually give you a lot of things that you can use. Um, I believe in incorporating a lot of videos um, in here. Um, in this link, there is um, videos to, it's a project um, out of the West Coast and from the Bay Area. It's one of the universities out there. And they, what they have done is have um, college students actually prepare these videos explaining different concepts, different science concepts to students through different experiments as well. And they, could do, they do it in either English or Spanish. And usually for your um, middle school and high school, they're great videos that demonstrate things that they can even do. There was one that has to do with, um, with strawberries and DNA. And so it teaches them how they could do this experiment and finding out DNA and all of that just with strawberries and simple household products. Um, and so, and she walks it through and she does it also in Spanish. It was really great. I encourage you to do so um, and check it out. Another one is science A through Z. So if you've seen Raz Kids or reading A through Z, they also have a science A through Z. And one of the good things I often encourage to incorporate a lot of reading, aside from what is on the textbook, okay? Kids need to see and read this information in different platforms in different places right not just in science class so if they're going to talk about planets it's not just planets here in, in in science they can talk about planets everywhere else okay um including math so this provides you with books that you can actually print in different reading levels and a lot of times if your school district already has a RAS kids um, um membership it's either very low cost or you could just you know piggyback off of that membership and they have them in um, english and in other languages including spanish ology allows you to do like um videos of dissections and things like that so if you don't if you don't happen to be able to do the dissections there, obviously you can actually um, look at it and get all of these there. And it's actually really cool. It has like dissections of like pigs and, and frogs and all that. Um, so step by step as well. This is for the younger ones, um, Peep and the Big World. And it has different concepts, science concepts, but explained in, um, you know, for, for younger kids. And it has it in both English and Spanish. And again, this uh, Kapili, as well as another site that it has a lot of tools in two languages, English and Spanish, and it's very, very cool, as well as Biology Corner. This one is more for your upper um, middle school and high school kids. I always often want to give tools that are not just for your elementary, but also for your middle and high schoolers. So this is another uh, great tool. Um, there's more here. Uh, one that I really um, liked or, and enjoyed, um, and going back to that social cultural competency, is involving families in the, in, the, in the conversation, right? And so here is a list, and I found it really, really interesting because it's a list of activities for science family nights, okay? And these, it has the entire thing it tells you exactly what you need. It tells you how much is it going to cost per family in terms of the materials that you will need. Um, and it just has a whole bunch of activities as well. And it has it for different grade levels. So it's great, 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 great resource. Um, I've talked about Unite for Literacy before, but um, in this case, I'm, I'm mentioning it again because it, they do have a section that is just in Spanish and they have other languages as well. Um, books that are related to science and different topics and different reading levels for students and they're digital. 
Um, actividades STEM, this is another site that you have different activities in Spanish for STEM activities. Okay, another website, SEDL, great website that you can check out. Those of you that are fo uh, following FOSS, FOSS does have, um, is a science kit. FOSS does, does have um, their resources in Spanish. So this is a link where you can go ahead and access the resources in Spanish just in case your school did not purchase them. So if your school did not, was not able to purchase them, you can go ahead and find them here. And then there's engineering resources. Remember, we gotta, we gotta encourage our students to also go into engineering as well. So there's a lot of engineering resources here for elementary all the way to high school. So with that being said, I'm gonna actually, uh, I wanted to leave some time for you guys to um, let me know what are some key takeaways from today? What are you thinking that are some ideas that you automatically think, oh my goodness, I'm going to incorporate this in my classroom? Um, or what are some things that you have already incorporated and how has that been um, for you? Um, I want you to take this time, we're gonna take a couple minutes just to share out those and for you to let me know uh, what are some ideas that you're taking away from today's webinar, um, you know, that are very important, so. If you want to just go ahead and unmute yourself and share, that's fine. If you want to share on the, in the chat box, that's fine. Erica will share it with us. I have um, a question. Oh, go ahead. Yes, questions as well. Parts to the hyperlink um, Unite for Literacy, did you just say it was free right now because of the COVID or is it free all, all year All the long? time. It's all the time. Because I just opened it up on my laptop and it's like broken down into like units. It's like amazing. Oh, let me tell you something. Once you go in there, you're going to be a little like, I heart this. Yes, because it has so many languages. So actually, you know what? Let, let's take a, if it's okay with everybody that we could take a look at it really quickly yeah. so that you can get familiarized. <laughs> and it just opened up to books like I'm like wait a minute what I'm like is it free just for now I'm like no is no so actually um it is not free just for now so this is the Spanish one okay but it I did it I linked just to specifically to Spanish science okay but if we just go on to um Which website was that? I'm sorry. That's Unite for Literacy. Okay. Um, let me see how I can. I mean, you could just. Um, let me see if I could go, just go back. And while you're doing that, I want to remind everyone that in the chat, I um, added the slides from today or uh, well, the PDF version. So all of these things are hyperlinked. So make sure you take a look in the chat and download that file that I added. So you have all books, okay? You could do unit in Spanish, you could do a search. Um, let's say, uh, no. I think they have like other, not, not words, uh, clear search, search options. Uh, okay. I think because I, I hyperlinked it to just um, uh, what you call it to this particular page, but nonetheless, if you go to unite for literacy, okay, dot com, go onto the site and hopefully, let me see if I I want to show it to you guys. Um, yeah, it's gonna, I don't know why it's taking me English. No. Um, Spanish, Espanol. These are some of the written, but then they have others. Um, they have even for math and things like that. Um, they have community, have family, they have so many other things and they have other languages. So I definitely recommend it for some reason it's not letting me go on to the other one because I hyperlinked it, but go on to it, explore the website. It has so many resources there and they're free. And this is, this has nothing to do with COVID. Um, I think now people are realizing that it does exist because of COVID, but, um, you know, not necessarily, um, 
uh, what to call it, it it's just there. So you could do both. So it'll it'll for example it'll. So. ¿Cómo te mantienes sano? For Holly Herman. So I will read it to the students. Nosotros sabemos cómo mantenernos sanos. ¿Y tú? Yo como comida saludable. Yo duermo bien. So, as you can see, this is something that you can utilize. You can, ta I mean, hey, if even if you don't have brass kids in your classroom or you don't have access to that many books because, you know, budget is tight, um, this is just amazing right there. You can, and you can link it and send it. Okay, so you can share it. You can tell your students, like, this is the book that I want you to read. Um, and then, obviously, you saw that they have them in English, so you can also have them in English as well. Um, so it's just, it's just a great resource, and it's free. You know me, I always like resources that are either free or very, very low cost. So the majority, if not all of the resources that I've mentioned today are um, free or at low cost. So that is one of the things that I, that I encourage you guys to check out. Um, and all, and all of the links are, are, you know, all of the resources are hyperlinked for you guys as well. So, um, so yeah, I hope I, under, I, I explained or I answered that question. Any other takeaways or questions that you may have? Alrighty, um, Erica, do we have any any other comments or anything? Oh, no other questions. Um, I just want to quickly remind everyone, um, since we are here at the end of our presentation, to return to my learning plan um, because your feedback is really important. We really value it. So if you can go back there to here where it says session workshop evaluation, you click on this little icon here and just give us some feedback. It's anonymous and it, you know, helps us with our future planning. Um, so I know that I, some people said that they weren't able to scroll up to the PDF. If you weren't able to just email me and I can um, send it to you that way. Um, and, you know, thank you so much for joining us again. And remember that we do have um, a few more sessions with Suzanne. Um, we're going to be looking at math and social studies as well. And one that's really targeted towards administrators, which um, is very much needed. So, and with that uh, being said, thank you guys again. If you have any questions or if you, if you even have like, questions when you're planning or things like that and you're like oh my goodness you know I remember she said something about this or x y and z or like, let me know, send me an email reach out and I will be more than happy to um to help you out with this I hope it was helpful and I hope it was fun those of you that won please don't forget to send me your an email with your name full name and your preference um and I wish you guys uh, all the best with the rest of the year. If I don't see you on the following webinars, if I do, I'll see you soon and stay safe, everyone. Thank you.